welcome everyone to Offsec Live. Uh, what we are doing today is we are going to look at Active Directory, uh, an introduction and some enumeration uh, from the content developer who uh, developed this module. So uh, you're in for a, a treat. Uh, but first, let's just do a little bit of an introduction. So your first presenter is Remy. No, it's me again. Uh, I was hoping I could shut up a little bit now, but yeah, I guess here we go. Obviously not me in a picture, but this is kind of turned into some sort of meme in in AFSEC. So so this is my handle or my my picture on social media, Discord and that kind of stuff. Uh, so my name is Remy. I work as a content developer in AFSEC. Uh, I've been in AFSEC now for, well, since 2016. Started off as a student admin back then. I worked as that for for two years. Had a lot of interactions with the students. Uh, enjoyed that quite a lot. And then uh, I went into a lead position, then some technical management, and then the COVID hit, and we started something called Afsec Academy. I don't know if we have any former Afsec Academy students here today, but if we do, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you still enjoy it because that's still a product that that Afsec delivers, right? Uh, then after that, I, I did a live training uh, in person. Uh, then I took a little bit of a break to get my hands dirty in the penetration testing industry in the real world to, to keep myself updated a little bit and that kind of stuff. Uh, and now I'm back as a content developer. And I wrote the, the Active Directory Introduction and Enumeration module. So, uh, so I'm happy to, to give a demo on that one today. Uh, Amy made the slides here, so I don't know what to say to those. Uh, she's 100% that I like donuts, uh, a little bit too much, and I like to lift things, uh, so powerlifting, that kind of stuff. So, lifting things, eating things, and hacking things that's kind of the that's the three things I like in life, and also my kids, obviously, right? Uh, they are on the same level as donuts, basically. So, back to you, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, my name is Amy. Uh, I work for offensive security as a vulnerable machine engineer. Uh, my uh, past before joining OffSec was I was working as a pen tester. So that's the uh, experience that I come to OffSec with. Um, I call myself an OffSec noob because I have been here for a just over a year and a half. So not as long as the other people. Um, I also like lifting things, not nearly as heavy as Remy, but maybe one day, you know, I can dream of uh, of being just as good as Remy. Um, and uh, I try to stay away from the donuts because watermelon is where it's at for me. Um, and uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a vulnerable machine engineer does, it means that uh, we create the machines. So uh, what I do is I, I help to create the labs and exam boxes for OffSec. Um, and this is just a quick little overview of all the things that we're going to be chatting to you about today. Um, so Remy is going to explain a few of the differences between the PIN 200 2022 and the new 2023, uh, so that you can get an understanding of the differences there. Um, we're then going to have a quick look at uh, enumeration methodology and uh, why I'm explaining this is that each step kind of carries over from one to the next. So uh, when we start looking at manual enumeration, we're going to start with legacy tools. Uh, these are tools that are already on Windows, which people are very familiar with using once you get some kind of foothold. Uh, and then we're going to move into looking how to do uh, basically a similar or the same thing uh, with PowerShell and .NET classes. And the step after that, we're going to move into using scripts like PowerView, which is a very popular script. Uh, with specific focus on object permissions. And then we're going to segue into automated enumeration uh, with a special focus on uh, sharp hand and blood hand. Uh, it's going to be a really, really cool demo. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring that chat uh, and um, asking Remy questions as we go, um, if the questions are uh, directly related to what he's showing. And if we don't ask uh, answer a question immediately, we can get to it at the end because we do have some time for Q&A. So uh, over to Remy again. Yes, yes. So yeah, obviously we are uh, talking about the new version of PWK, the 2023 version. So uh, next slide, uh, Amy, please. Here we go. 
So I just want to touch base on some of the differences in the modules from the 2020 edition of PWK to the 2023, right? So <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, I have been talking to students for many, many years, and I really, really appreciate the feedback we are getting. And I wrote this module quite a lot based on the feedback that I was getting when I was working directly with the students, right? Um, Active Directory can be a little bit of an intimidating thing because it's so huge and so complex and it can be a little bit difficult to grasp it. Um, in addition to that, in the previous version of PWK, we kind of threw a PowerShell script at you guys and told you to, hey, script this and, and you know everything is going to be fine. And the script worked, right? But it was a little bit PowerShell heavy. Uh, so for this edition right now, we are taking a deeper dive into PowerShell and .NET classes in the directory services namespace. And we are still building our own script as a transition into PowerView, right? Because you kind of want to understand what your scripts are doing. And if you, if you don't understand the PowerShell code, then you don't really know what PowerView is doing either if, if you use that or Bloodhound for that matter, right? So we take a deeper dive there. Uh, We're using way more PowerView now for the manual enumeration. There has been some... Uh, changes from Microsoft uh, when it comes to logged on session enumeration, which is kind of painful. Uh, it was introduced in, uh, in a somewhat specific Windows 10 version, and we're going to touch base on that in the call today uh, and in the courseware, of course. <laughs> uh, a new introduction is object permissions, which is very important to enumerate when you look through Active Directory. They can be a little bit tricky to get a grasp on, but I hope that with the, with the current courseware, you will be able to learn it pretty fast, right? Also domain shares is a new thing that we enumerate more in the course now. And of course, Sharpound and Bloodhound is kind of two go-to tools that we really, really need to understand uh, if we're gonna enumerate, especially bigger organizations, right? So it gives you some, some fancy graphics and that kind of stuff. And we're gonna do that in the demo today as well. Now, the last point here is a dedicated environment tailored with exercises for each section. And this is not only true for the ED module, this is true for every single module, right? So you will be able to spin up your own group of virtual machines, follow along the course material so you can do exactly what we are doing in a course. And then you have another VM group, which is called kind of exercises, right? Where we do some slight changes and you will be able to kind of test your abilities based on what you learned, right? I can assure you that those are not super complex, uh, but I really, really recommend going through them to, you know, at least as a verification that you understand the content, right? Then of course we have capstones as well, which we have talked a lot about before. Uh, I think there is a capstone for each module and I really recommend going through those as well because they're gonna test everything that, that you learned in the module, right? So you can't really know what to expect there. Um, and they're they gonna act as a really, really good primer uh, before you dive into the challenge labs, right? So I think that's it what I have to say uh, on the slide there, Amy. If if you guys have any questions about anything, feel free to type it into the into the chat, right? We're going to try to monitor that as much as possible. So I don't remember what the next slide is, uh, Amy. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't memorize no this. Okay, there we go. it's your turn. <laughs> yes. It's my turn again. Yay. Okay, so this is a... Uh a graphic that we created just to try and explain a little bit what we mean when it comes to Active Directory enumeration and the methodology to do that. Um, and this is a combination of something that is linear and circular. Uh, and that's because um, the process isn't somewhere that you just start and you finish up and it's very easy to get to point from point A to point B. So uh, the demo that we're showing today is um, is we're starting with the foothold already. We don't have to get that foothold, so we're not covering that stage um, of attacking. Uh, but once you've got that foothold, you're then going to want to enumerate. Um, and if you do an enumeration really thoroughly and really carefully, you're likely to find something that we are referring to as an additional foothold. An additional foothold could be access to a different user, access to a different machine that then helps you get uh, make extra steps on your way to trying to compromise that domain. Uh, and what I've added here is a section for notes because 
whatever your methodology is, whatever is most comfortable to you, uh, get in the habit of documenting everything that you do because you don't know at what point uh, as part of your test or as part of your studying that that information is actually going to be valuable and the thing that you need uh, to get to that actual domain compromise. So. Uh, and you'll see there's a little, um, there's three little arrows inside that uh, circular diagram. Uh, and that shows that that's not just a process that you do once. It's a process that you have to do over and over and over again uh, to actually be able to move all the way through um, an active directory environment. Um, and once you've got a little bit more information, you can then start with lateral movement. Um, that arrow starts with blue and ends in purple because it's also hinting back at the circular section that you may have to do a few other things before you can actually make progress again, before you get to domain compromise um, and being able to uh, submit your report or whatever it is to your client. Uh, and that is it for AD enumeration. And we're going to, uh, I'm going to now explain to you the corp.com environment, which Remy is going to be uh, doing his demo in. There are, uh, six machines in corp.com, uh, three clients, a web box, uh, a file server, and a domain controller. Um, there are seven users in this domain. Uh, you can read their names there. Uh, and it's just, this is obviously a small environment. We don't want to have something too big that gets overwhelming. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of exactly what is in this environment before we jump into the demo. And it's back over to you, Remy. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's see if I can share my screen then. That would be pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. I think we're good. Can someone Success. in the chat? Okay. So you can see it on your end. Uh, chat. Yes. I've always seen streamers talk to their chat. It's, uh, it's, uh, I like to do this. Where's the Rickroll? We, we might get a Rickroll eventually. Uh, can you guys see the, the screen there now, Kali, and the Windows box? I know there is a little bit of a delay. Okay, nice. Cool. Thank you for, for verifying that. Okay, so we're going to start enumerating Active Directory eventually, right? I actually want to introduce Active Directory first because, I don't know, how many are about, heard about Active Directory and have played around inside Active Directory? While you guys answer that, I'm, I'm actually just going to go ahead and start here. So, okay, we have one. <laughs> Probably have a few more, but in case someone hasn't seen AD before, uh, I just want to show you guys around a little bit, right? So we are not working as a penetration tester at this point. At this point, we are actually a sysadmin, right? I'm connected to a Windows box here. This is the domain controller for the corp.com domain. And it's kind of the end goal for the penetration test, right? At least in this case, it's not, I'm not saying that domain admin is the end goal for all penetration tests, but for this one, it's gonna be our end goal, right? Uh, but I'm logged in here now as Jeff admin, which is a domain admin for the corp.com domain, right? So being logged in on the domain controller, and if I type active directory here on the start menu, we have some different apps. Right, we have Active Directory domains and trusts, sites and services, uh, the ED module for Windows PowerShell. This is a pretty cool one because you can actually manage Active Directory just using PowerShell. Uh, it sounds hardcore, but it, it's it's actually pretty cool. We have Administrative Center and we have Users and Computers. Users and Computers is the management app for Active Directory. This is the app most sysadmins spend most of their time in when they are dealing with AD, especially when they are making changes and that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to focus on this one. I'm going to start it here. And we can see that we are met with a graphical user interface mm -hmm. of some sort. Um, and before even talking about, you know, enumeration and that kind of stuff, I want you guys to just look at this as kind of a database, right? Uh, that contains a bunch of objects. And an object, that can be a user object. It could be a group object. It could be a computer, right? It could be a wealth of other things as well. Everything stored here is basically an object. And those are the, the things we are interested in, in enumerating from the penetration testing perspective, right? On the left side here, we see that we have corp.com. 
in this case, we only have one domain controller. We only have one domain. Uh, in other cases, you might see several domains here, right? Like for example, sales.corp.com or development.corp.com. I mean, there, there might be many domains, but in this case, we only have one corp.com. If I expand this, we can see that we have a bunch of folders and this is as default as it gets really in Active Directory. We, we haven't really made a lot of changes in Active Directory here. This is kind of what you get when you install the AD service. And this is basically it. Uh, some of those are, I mean, we can see this, uh, these as folders, right? But some of them, uh, them are actually called organizational units. And you can create as many as you'd like in your AD environment, right? In this case, we haven't really separated a lot of stuff because it's a small domain. Uh, according to, to Amy's slide, we only have like nine users or something and, and six machines, right? So it doesn't really make sense uh, separating it too much. But let's have a look at, for example, the computers folder or organizational unit, right? Under here, we can see that we have five machines, client 74, 75, 76, files of four, web of four. Those are the computers in the domain known as objects. So whenever I say object, I might be talking about users, groups, computers, whatever, right? Uh, if you go into the domain controllers, we also have an object, in this case, DC1. This is the machine we are currently connected to, right? The central piece, the, the, the central component storing AD, serving AD, right? Storing all the objects and everything. So this is the most important server in the network. Without this, the, the domain just wouldn't function, right? Uh, I want to go back to computers real quick, and we can double click one of them, for example, client 74. Keep in mind that we are still working as a sysadmin at this point, right? We are not penetration testing this right yet. We, we're going to get to that eventually, but this is just the AD introduction I wanted to do for this call. So double click in client 74, for example, we have some information. We have a general tab. It says client 74 here. We have a DNS name, which is client74.corp.com. If I go to operating system, for example, we can see Windows 11 Pro version 10 version, well, actually version 22,000 here, right? So the information you see in those boxes are known as attributes. And those attributes are what we are interested in trying to enumerate as much as we can from the outside as a normal domain user, right? At this point, it's really easy for us to, to see what's here because we are logged in as domain admin. So we are kind of cheating ourselves a little bit, maybe. But keep in mind that this is just an introduction. So that, that's basically it for the computer. So there, there, there are so many things we can go through here. Uh, you will have the option to log in as domain admin uh, in, the, um, in the module. So I recommend doing that if you haven't seen AD before and just get to know it a little bit, right? If you go down to users, uh, by default, we have a bunch of groups here as well in the users folder, right? Plus the users. It's a little bit weird, I have to admit, but this is the default setup. So we went with that. If you, for example, double click the domain admins group and we click members, for example, right? Here we can see that administrator and Jeff admin, they are domain admins. If we as a sysadmin wanted to add someone else here, we could just click add and we could add another domain admin. And essentially they would be, you know, they would have the highest privilege possible within a domain, right? So keep in mind, Jeff admin and administrator, they are domain admins. So hopefully we can figure that out without having to log into AD and check. Uh, if you click on Jeff admin here, for example, his user, we under general, we have a bunch of other attributes as well. We can see that we haven't really filled out a whole lot here. Uh, so there is not really much to enumerate for those particular attributes for Jeff Admin, right? But let's add, for example, a description here. We can do OSL call 24th of March, right? We can apply it. And then we can see if we are able to enumerate this from the penetration testing perspective afterwards. That would be cool, right? Um, we can go to account here. Uh, we can see his username. Uh, it's a domain name and then Jeff admin. We can see in this case that the password never expires is set, for example, which I would say is a bad security practice in Active Directory. Uh, if 
you know, the account gets compromised and you don't need to change the password, it might stay compromised for quite a while, right? But even though if you gain access to a domain admin, uh, you will be able to set this setting yourself as well, right? So, but yeah, I would say don't have password never expires on your stuff, right? Um, in the lab, we had to do this because we obviously want you guys to, to log in without having to brute force a password every, every time it has to be changed, right? We aren't that evil. So also if you go to member affair, we can see again, Rather than going to the domain admins group and see who's a member, we can also enumerate the user and see that, okay, Jeff Admin is a part of the domain admins, right? So look at this as kind of a database. We want to enumerate this, and uh, we're going to try to do that right now. Uh, if you have any questions, just type them out in the chat. We can revisit this later as well if needed. But for now, I'm going to log out of the domain controller. And we're going to start our penetration test, right? So I'm currently logged in to client 75 as the user Stephanie. Uh, this is a low privileged domain user. We are not local admin on the box or anything like that. I mean, we can check that real quick. For example, by trying to start command prompt as administrator, we're getting prompted for a password and we don't have any password. So we are not the local admin here, most likely, right? I mean, there are several other ways we could use to check as well. Uh, but yeah, this is our standpoint and uh, or starting point, right? We could, for example, say this is an assumed breach scenario. So it's a gray box penetration test. Let's say we were handed a laptop with a username and a password that allows us to log into the domain. Or maybe we, we compromised Stephanie via some sort of client side attack or something like that, right? So we can use our imagination for that. Uh, can you guys see the text here or should I increase it? I would like to keep it like this, uh, but if not, let me know if it's, if it's too small. Bigger, I, I can go one one bigger maybe. Let's see, font. We can try 28 and see, see how it looks like. It's a little bit bigger. Okay, so we are now in a command prompt. We can type who am I? I'm pretty sure all of you know what the who am I command is, but I've seen some confusion when it comes to, to a domain versus local machines. Um, on where exactly you are logged in, right? So in this case, we can see that we have the corp backslash. This means that we are logged into the domain itself as the user Stephanie. If this said client 75, we would not be logged into the domain. Then we would have a local user account on the client 75, right? And speaking of local user accounts, we can type net user. I'm sure most of you have heard about this before. Uh, this is a legacy tool that has been you know, in uh, in Windows forever, pretty much. And if we type this, we can see that we can, we have the user accounts for client 75, which is an administrator, some default accounts and an offsec account, right? Now we can use net user to prod, for example, offsec directly. And looking here, we can see that offsec is a part of the local admin group on the system itself on client 75. Uh, and we need to keep in mind now that we don't have local admin privileges on this box. So it could be one of our goals eventually to try to find a service or maybe somehow take over the AppStick account to get admin privileges. Mm -hmm. uh, but we kind of did this on purpose, starting with a low preview user, just to show how much stuff you can actually do just with a regular domain user, right? So... We're starting the course with what I like to call legacy tools, NetEXE, because you can actually do some, uh, some enumeration with it in the domain as well. Now, if I just type net user, as we saw, it's going to enumerate the local accounts on client 75. But if I add slash domain to the account, we can see here, or not to the account, to the command, sorry. We can see that request is being processed at a domain controller for domaincorp.com, right? And we can see that it actually outputs the user account stored on DC, on the domain controller for the domain. So just from a low privileged user, we are actually able to enumerate which users are present in a domain. We have Dave, 
We have IIS service, Jeff, Jeff Admin, Jen, KRBTGT, Pete, and Stephanie, right? This is what we saw earlier when we had a look at uh, Active Directory itself. Um, and we can now start prodding users directly. What I like to do is to have a look at my own user. You should always know what your, your you know, foot tool can do, right? So let's clear the screen and do a net user Stephanie and do slash domain. Well, actually, let, let, just to showcase this, because I know that there, there is a little bit of confusion sometimes on this local versus domain thing, right? If I just do net user Stefan here, we can see that the username could not be found. And this is because this query is being run locally on the client 75. So in order to figure out this in a domain, you need the slash domain flag to run this via LDAP, which is the communication protocol used by Active Directory, right? We dive much deeper into LDAP in the course. I don't want to talk too much about LDAP here. Uh, I rather want to show some, some cool enumeration and, and maybe do some hacking as well, right? So let's check Stephanie. We can see now that the process is, uh, it, the, the command is processed at the DC for corp.com. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, attributes here. This is uh, similar to what we saw in Active Directory earlier. Um, and we can see we are a part of the domain users, right? That's something we could expect. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to log in here. But we can also see that Stephanie is a part of the sales department, which is a group as well, probably not standard in Active Directory, right? So this is a group that we possibly want to try to enumerate at some point. Let's run the same command on uh, Jeff Admin, right? So instead of Jeffany, uh, <laughs> Jeffany, Stephanie, we do Jeff Admin slash domain. And we can see that he's a domain admin, right? So we don't actually need to cheat and go into Active Directory to figure out the domain admins. We can do that from a low priv domain user. And if we look at the comment here as well, this is the comment we added as an attribute earlier in the description field, right, for Jeff Admin. And I have found many, many weird things in description fields in my life, including passwords, because some sysadmins may think that, hey, no one is ever going to see this anyway, only the ones looking at AD, right? Little do they know that you can actually enumerate this from a remote standpoint with a low preview user. I'm not saying all sysadmins are doing that, obviously, but I've seen some weird setups from time to time during penetration tests, right? So this essentially wraps up what we want to do with the legacy tools, because there are some restrictions on this uh, NetEXE that we, we may not be aware of, but we actually, we, we have no other choice than to diving into PowerShell a little bit when it comes to AD enumeration, right? In the course, we build our own script, own enumeration script. Uh, I didn't want this to be a scripting call, so we're simply just going to skip that for now, and we're just going to dive right into PowerView, right, and try to do some, mm -hmm. you know, nasty stuff. So I'm going to clear my screen. I'm going to start PowerShell. Actually, let me do PowerShell EP bypass because PowerView is a script and we need to bypass the execution policy in PowerShell in order to run it, right? So I'm going to go into the C colon tools folder on the client 75. If you take the course, you will also have access to this. It's already pre-built, right? We have a bunch of tools here, but for now, we're going to focus on PowerView before we eventually move into Sharpound, right? We're going to do that in this call as well, which is why I might be talking a little bit too fast here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, tell me to calm down if it goes too fast, right? Um, so to import PowerView, we just do import module and we point to PowerView. We hit enter and PowerView is now loaded in memory. Uh, Amy, I don't know if you have the link for PowerView, if you could maybe share that. Well, actually I have it here as well. Sure, maybe we, I can yeah. share that in the chat. Okay, yeah, I also shared it. We, we can spam it a little bit so, so people can see it, right? I've seen big streamers uh, spam stuff, but they have like 30K viewers. We, have, we, we are not quite there yet, but you know, it is what it is. So that's the link for PowerView. And the reason we're giving the link now is that PowerView has so many commands. It's actually kind of insane uh, how many commands you have there. So I don't want to go ahead and run get help and then go through all the commands. I would rather 
uh, you guys to, to just check the script out and you can see all the commands available. Um, also, if you want to learn something about a specific command there, which I had to do when actually creating this module, I highly recommend doing that because there are some really cool stuff going on. I also want to mention that Power BI is not, I don't think it's maintained anymore and it's a pretty old script, uh, but it still works. So we decided to add it into PWK 2023 as well, way more now than we did it uh, back in 2020. Um, actually, I think what we had for 2020 doesn't really work that well anymore uh, for newer operating systems, right? Which is also something we need to troubleshoot a little bit. So we have imported Power Review here now, and let's try to repeat some of the enumeration that we did with NetEXE, right? So instead of using net user now, we can just do get net user. That's the commandlet in Power Review to pump out all the users in the domain. And when it comes to LDAP, Power Review is actually doing the same as the script we develop ourselves in PWK to acquire the correct LDAP path, right? Uh, yes, you can use Power Review in Kali. But it's a, I mean, it's a PowerShell script, right? So, I mean, you could start PowerShell there and, and go ahead, but yeah. I'm using it in Windows in this case. So let's run get net user and see what we get, right? Uh, I can, uh, yeah, sorry, I, yes, the rest of, uh, I don't know if I got your name correctly there, but yeah, I can, I can move the, the cursor. So we run get net user, and we get a bunch of information. I would maybe expect to just get the usernames. But if we scroll here a little bit, we can see that we, we I wouldn't say endless because we don't have a lot of objects in this domain, but we have quite a lot of output. And this is one of the disadvantages when it comes to Power Review, right? You need to find a way to parse the data because let's imagine you're a pen testing an organization with 10,000 users. This output would just be... I mean, not really manageable, right? So we're gonna have a look here. So this, what I'm marking here is the attributes and properties we get for one single user in the domain, right? Some of those might be more interesting than others. Um, for example, knowing the SAM account type, which is a user object, we don't really need to know that, right? Because we are actually looking for users here. Uh, but just to come with a, come up with an example, for example, some account name, which is the username for the user, most likely, and maybe, uh, let's see, last logon, for example. This could also be interesting when they logged on the last time. The cool thing with Power Review is that you can actually pipe the whatever you want into select, so like this. And I can simply now just say, okay, I want the SAM account name. I just need to learn how to type. I think SAM account type, no, no, name, account name. And then last logon, for example, right? If I do this, we get a nice list of users on the left side. And we can see here that we have the last logon for the users as well on the right side. So, if we see users here that hasn't been logged in for quite a while, then the account might just be dormant. I mean, it's enabled most likely, but because I, I, if I remember correctly, disabled accounts doesn't show here. So if we see someone being logged in for, for ages ago, that might be an account we are interested in trying to compromise, right, at some point. Also, if the, the account isn't used on a daily basis, we have a higher chance of flying under the radar when it comes to being caught and that kind of stuff. Now, I just want to mention as well that Power Review and this AD enumeration we are doing here is pretty noisy. So if you're working in a red team engagement, for example, you probably don't want to run those commands, right? But for pen testing with Kali Linux, we don't really care too much about the radar um, and we can do whatever we want, right? Which is what I'm planning to do right here. So this is get net user. Now, obviously, if you just want a clean list of users, we just remove the, the last log on here. We rerun it and we get a nice list of users here, which we could add to our word list or something like that, right? In either case, we need to make sure that we are documenting our work here. 
that's something I also need to touch base on because right now I'm not documenting what I'm doing. It would simply take too much time uh, in a call, but make sure that you are documenting everything from you start to the end of the penetration test because you might get some surprises along the way, right? So this is it for the user enumeration with Power Review. We can also have a look at the groups with Power Review. We can do get net group, for example, like this. And again, we are getting a bunch of attributes, a lot of them. Trying to parse this would be, or trying to just read this would be close to impossible, right? And keep in mind that this is a small environment. So we need to parse the data somehow. Um, and we can, for example, do select uh, some account name for groups as well. If we do that, we have a nice list over the groups in the domain. And we see a lot more groups here than we did earlier with net.exe, right? This is because we are using .NET classes in the directory services namespace, which is kind of tailored for those kind of things. And instead of just seeing the global groups, we can actually see the domain local groups as well, which could also be of interest to, to um, enumerate, right? If you go to the bottom here, we see at least three groups that is probably not standard in AD, sales department, management department, and development department, right? So earlier we enumerated, well, did we though? I'm, I'm actually gonna enumerate the sales department with net exe once more, just to show you guys. Net group, sales department, domain, right? So this is net exe right now. This is not PowerShell or Power Review. We can see that Stephanie, and Pete, they are a member of the sales department group, correct? If I do get net group here now with PowerShell or Power Review, and we point to the sales department and let's go ahead and select member. We don't need all the attributes that we saw earlier, right? We see something quite different than we did before. Let me just explain the output here a little bit. We don't just see Stephanie here. Uh, we see uh, all sorts of other kind of weird things as well. DC Corp, DC Com, for example, and CN users, CN Stephanie. This is actually known as a distinguished name in Active Directory, which is a unique value for Stephanie in this case. Stephanie is the common name. Users is also a common name, which represent the container that Stephanie is stored. DC in this case does not stand for domain controller. It stands for domain component. And DC corp, DC com is kind of the, what should we call it? Root or base domain, right? This is where our search will start. But this is a unique identifier for Stephanie, which is required by LDAP to function. So this is why it looks a little bit weird maybe, um, but we are explaining this in a course where, so don't worry if, if, you, if you may not have seen this before, right? But looking at this output compared to what we do, did with NetEXE, do you guys see a difference here in the outputs? We need some more hype in the chat. <laughs> I hope someone sees the difference there. Hype. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Hype. So is that everything you can see or a hype? I'm, I'm sure you can see something else as well, right? Based on the outputs here, more hype, okay. I guess I will just have to spell it out. We're gonna have more of those quizzes eventually, by the way. So be prepared, right? I may just stop and not, not do anything else before we either get a gift, <laughs> gifted sub or someone gives me the answer, right? Anyway, jokes aside, we net group, or with net exe, we can see that Stephanie is a member and we can see that Pete is a member, right? However, with Power View, the get net group command, we can see Stephanie, we can see Pete, which makes sense. But we also see development department, right? So net exe kind of lied a little bit to us earlier when it said that only Pete and Stephanie was members, but the development department is actually a member as well. And this has to do with the abilities of NetEXE to be able to enumerate groups, right? We can see direct user members. 
but with NetEXE under the right circumstances, you cannot see the direct you or group members, right? Hope that makes sense. And I hope that now that I pointed it out that, that you can see the difference here, right? So this makes me a little bit curious. Let's go ahead and enumerate the rest of the groups as well. So we redo the command from the sales department. Well, actually not the net, uh, net exe. We're gonna do get net group with power review. So we see development department is a member of sales department. So let's go ahead and enumerate the development department as well. Okay, so in development department, we have management department. Okay, so let's enumerate that one. Boom, there you go. Jen is a member of the management department. And Wally V4, you are correct. This is nested groups, right? And we just uh, unraveled them using Power Review here. Nested groups is absolutely something you will, I will say that you will see this in Active Directory during penetration tests, right? This is a great way to scale and all of that stuff. Um, and I think actually for every single pen test I've done, I have seen the nested groups. But looking here, we start from the sales department and go all the way to the management department. Can anyone tell me which group or groups Jen is actually a member of here? in a default Active Directory setup with inheritance enabled? I kind of gave away the answer there maybe, but we'll, we'll see. I want to see if anyone follows along uh, on what's going on here. We're going to have the, the awkward silence. I know you like awkward silence, Amy. Yeah, so you guys are absolutely on the on the correct path here, right? Jen is a member of the management department. Management department is a member of the development department, and development department is a member of the sales department. So in theory, she's actually a part of all three groups, right? Yes, uh, XDAC, all nested groups. So imagine. If this was domain admin, for example, it, fortunately it's not. We didn't make it that you know super easy to get through the course. But imagine as a sysadmin, you do a mistake when you do the nested groups like this. I mean, who knows? Maybe the development department in this case has local admin privileges on all clients, maybe even on servers in the domain via GPO, right? That's going to be up to us to enumerate. But if that's the case, Jen will also have that access. So if we are able to control Jen here somehow, we may at some point elevate our privileges in a domain, right? Make sense? So this is cool. Cool. I'm glad it makes sense. I'm happy to, happy to see that. Uh, so this kind of wraps up the group and user enumeration. We, we need to move on. We need to enumerate some more cool stuff, right? So I'm going to clear my screen here. Um, normally in a penetration test, if you have a bunch of IPs or clients, you would have to run Nmap, for example, or yes, this is live, uh, Manish. Uh, you would have to run Nmap or various recon tools in order to figure out what kind of operating systems are running, right? With Active Directory, however, as we saw earlier, this is an actual attribute and we, we, don't, we don't really need Nmap in this case. Maybe we do at some point. But let's run get net computer, for example, like this. I'm sorry, I'm going to move the mouse. Uh, I keep forgetting that. Let's run get net computer. Much like the users and the groups, we are getting a bunch of attributes. Those are the attributes available to us and uh, properties for one single computer object in the domain, right? We need to parse the data. This is one of the downsides I will have to say with Power Review in, in larger operations. It's gonna be really tricky unless you have everything un under total control, right? But let's see, we can have, for example, operating system, since we wanna enumerate operating systems, that's a good one to filter on and maybe DNS host name, right? So let's do operating system. Let me clear my screen. I'm gonna do select and I'm gonna choose operating system and maybe add DNS host name, right? To see what we are dealing with here. 
And this gives us a really nice list. We have three server 2022s here. We have a domain controller. We have a web 04, most likely a web server. I would guess a file server or files of four, which is hopefully a file server, right? Plan 74, 75, 76. And this is information we saw earlier when we were sysadmining around, right? But now we are just enumerating this based on attributes. And this is pretty cool. Now, if you are to run an Nmap scan, for example, on those from Kali, you may not, if, if you don't have the DNS correctly set up, you may not be able to resolve uh, the host name. For that, we can just do our resolve. Let's see, we could do NS lookup as well. I mean, we many ways we can do this. But we have a resolve IP address uh, commandlet in PowerView. So I'm just going to do an example here on client 76. And we have the IP address as well, which we could add directly into our text file and feed it to Nmap, right? Obviously, with a bunch of computers, you would probably script this and get a nice list of IPs, right? So that was kind of what I wanted to show for the computer enumeration. We're going to move into something way cooler, in my opinion now. But this is kind of how you start gathering information in Active Directory. I would start with users groups possibly computers and try to parse the data and look at what you got, right? So far, we, we, we have no attack vector, like whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Seems we are pretty far away from it as well, right? So I was talking about getting to know our user a little bit better earlier, right? There's a tool or a command called find local admin access in PowerView. This is noisy as, this is actually insanely noisy. It's gonna try to connect to every single machine in a domain, establish a handle, and if success, it's gonna deem that you have local admin access on the machine, right? So if there is any SOC analyst in the PWK lab right now, they should <laughs> hopefully get some alarms. Uh, but we don't really care about the SOC analyst at this point because we are we, we don't need to fly under the radar, right? So we, we will just go on. In this case, we can see that find local admin access didn't give us anything. Right, which might be expected. Seems like Stephanie might not be a very powerful account. Uh, doesn't really have access to anything uh, as far as I can tell. And this moves into what we're gonna cover next, which is logged on sessions. Because we need to be able to figure out the relationships in the domain and try to find some attack vectors, right? For this, we will still use Power Review for the time being. We will dive into Bloodhound in a couple of minutes here. But there is a command called get net session, and we can, for example, do files of four here. We want to see the sessions on files of four. All of those tools are allowed on the exam wall, yes. No restrictions on the Power Review or Bloodhound or NetEXE. So get net session, if we dive into the Power Review code a little bit, it's actually using two APIs. It's using the network station enum API which require administrative access on a target machine in order to figure out whether or not or who is logged into the system. We know already that we are not local admin on any boxes, so that option is going to fail for us 100%. The second API is the net session enum API, which it has different query levels, but PowerView is operating by default on query level 10, which I believe Bloodhound is doing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's trying to connect to a specific registry hive in Windows to figure out whether or not there is someone logged in on a box. So it doesn't require admin privileges, right? So let's try to run this. Files of four, no sessions. Web04, no sessions. Let's do client 74. I like the number four today for some reason. No sessions, right? So we could probably now say that, okay, there are no sessions on those machines, but if we add some verbosity to our command here, <clears throat> right? We can actually see that we are getting access denied message on files so far. Let's do web before as well. 0404 doesn't exist. So I just need to learn how to type like this. Access denied. Let's do client 74. Access denied. Why is that, right? This is actually where I kind of run into a little bit of a rabbit hole when writing this module. Um, because this 
was this used to be such a great way to enumerate sessions in the domain, right? But it seems like get nest session enum just doesn't really work that well anymore. And it has to do with the operating systems we have in the labs. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste the command here now. So we're going to have a look at the operating systems and their versions with the GetNet computer, right? So we saw, saw this earlier. The oldest machine is a Windows 10 Pro machine. It's running version 16.299, which I believe corresponds to build 17.09. And right around the area, the, the documentation for Microsoft is not really clear on this, when this change happened. But around Windows 10 build 17.09 and Windows Server 2019 build 18.09, there was a change to our registry hive that we need for net session enum to work. We're going to have a quick look at that hive now on the Windows 11 box. This might be a little bit different for the Windows 10 box, but we'll, we'll have a look at it, right? We're going to get ACL here on the Landman server default security. And we're going to have a little look at the access permissions on it. So we, for net session enum to work, we need to be able to read this key, right? Built-in users, they are allowed to read the key. Built-in administrators are allowed to read the key. Well, they have full control. Same with entity authority system, they have full control as well. Creator owner has full control. Application package authority, all application packages are allowed to read the key. And this is a SID or unforgeable token in Windows. Um, that you know gives access to certain items. But if you Google this seed, it's actually, I think, I wonder if this is gonna be the same on almost all Windows 11 systems, right? It's allowed to read the key, but from a remote standpoint, those permissions does not allow us to actually read this key from client 75 as Stephanie, right? So get next session in them doesn't work here. If we had older systems in the lab, then yes, it would probably work. So I wouldn't just throw net session in them away um, but I know that many people think that uh, Sharpound and Bloodhound is like, okay, the, those are the, the, the god tools when it comes to this kind of stuff. But that Sharpound is also using Get Net Session Enum and Get Net Workstation Enum or Net Workstation Enum rather. I think that's two out of three ways that Bloodhound is also trying to enumerate logged on sessions in the, in the network, right? So Microsoft made AD enumeration much harder right? There is a third option, however, which we have introduced in the PEM 200 course, which is called PS Logged On. PS Logged On is essentially, well, actually, let's just run it first, and I'm going to explain later. Let's run it against files of four, right? Based on the output here, Jeff is logged in on the files of four machine. And the reason we are seeing this is because PS Logdown is using something completely different than get nest session enum to, to find this information. It's actually relying on the remote registry, which also has some restrictions we need to think about, right? Because I think, uh, if I remember correctly, um, the remote registry has been disabled by default since Windows 8 or something like that. Uh, and on servers, it's actually running by default. However, well, actually on, on later service or server versions, it's running by default, uh, but it's being disabled after 10 minutes of inactivity, but there is a trigger. So when someone tries to connect to the remote registry, it's gonna start again. So on clients, we may not be able to get a lot of information, but I have seen on penetration tests that clients also have this enabled for different reasons. They might deplace or deploy some agents uh, into the network or backwards compatibility. I mean, so many different things it could be, right? But at least PS logged on was able to find Jeff logged in on files of four here, right? Let's do Web04 as well. Nope. Let's do client 74 since those are the machines we focused on so far. Um, and based on the output, does anyone see anything of interest uh, at all so far? Blood on uses remote sound curves, or yeah, yeah, also true. It might be able to find more sessions than than I'm doing here. We'll we'll have a look in a few there. But does anyone see anything of interest in the output uh, I currently have here? 
Jeff Admin. DP Cypher Bytes, you are absolutely correct. Jeff Admin is indeed an interesting account, right? We don't have any attack path just yet because we don't have access to, to Client 74. But if we at some point are able to get access to Client 74 and elevate ourselves to administrator there, we could actually do a targeted attack on Jeff Admin and we could become domain admins ourselves. We could possibly dump his NTLM hash or we could inject into some process that Jeff Admin is running on the machine and then just impersonate him, running commands as domain admin, right? I also want to highlight Jeff being logged in on, on the files of four here, because in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, Jeff Admin is doing something he shouldn't be doing here. He's browsing around on clients with his domain admin account. And this is something I see way too much on penetration tests as well. Uh, Yes, it's an easy way to log into a machine, your local admin, you, you have access to everything and you can do your job. But if you, if an attacker takes over your account, your whole domain might just be completely borked. Uh, and I saw some mention about a golden ticket earlier uh, in the chat as well. And you could actually forge one of those and have access to the domain for God knows how long, right? So if you're a sysadmin, just don't browse around with your domain admin account. It is a bad idea, right? In this case, I would probably guess that Jeff has the same password as Jeff Admin as well. I think they are the same person. So if we're able to, to get a control of Jeff and get his password, then who knows? Maybe password review, uh, reuse also comes to play, right? So many options here, but we don't have an attack path just yet. Let's remember, though, that Jeff Admin is connected to Client 74 because that seems to be a significant, you know, thing for us right now. That wraps up the user or the logged on sessions for now. We're going to move on to something else that we introduce in the course, a completely new thing called object permissions. And I'm actually going to start Notepad here and give a little bit of a history around it before we just dive in. Uh, let me edit and change the font here a little bit to make it, let's see, 24 maybe. Yeah, I think, I think this is probably good enough, right? So object permissions are permissions, or actually you can call it ACLs. It stands for access control list, right? In the access control list, you have a bunch of ACEs, which stands for access control entry. So short, we say ACEs, right? Or ACEs or whatever you want to call it. A bunch of ACEs eventually makes up an ACL, which is essentially what we're going to try to enumerate here, right? Keep in mind that those are set on specific objects in Active Directory, right? Um, and if time permits, after we're done with the demo, uh, I can show how to set this as well uh, in Active Directory as a sysadmin, right? Now, looking at some of the AC, uh, ACLs here or, or object permissions, we have something called generic all. This is the most powerful one. And as I've written there, it gives you full permission on the object. So for the object that you have generic all on, you might as well just be the domain admin because you can do exactly what you want, everything you want with that object. You are in complete control, right? Generic all is very powerful. We also have generic write where you can edit certain attributes on the object. So if we are able to edit attributes, we might be able to take over the, the object as well, right? Write owner, we can change the ownership for, for an object. Write the ACL here, we can edit ACEs on the object. Eventually, we could probably give ourselves full control using this, right? Uh, all extended writes, this is something that I've seen. Well, actually, write the ACL, all extended writes, and generic all is what I've seen the most. All extended writes is kind of a cool thing because it allows you to change the password or reset the password on a domain object, right? So we know that Pete and Stephanie, they are working in the sales department based on our enumeration. Let's just imagine that Pete keeps on forgetting his password every single day, right? He calls Jeff Admin and goes, hey, Jeff, can, can you reset my password? I, I forgot it. And uh, maybe Jeff Admin is getting a little bit uh, pissed off about this and he doesn't want to reset Jeff Ad or Pete's password every day. Then he might, let's say he gives all extended rights to Stephanie for, as an example, allowing her to change 
the password for Jeff or Pete, sorry. Right? So Jeff Admin doesn't have to do this job all the time. He's just delegating it to, to Stephanie by giving all extended rights on the Pete user object. So in that case, Stephanie can just go ahead and change Pete's password each time he forget, uh, forgets it, right? Or a pen tester comes in and takes advantage of this. Force change password, obviously a very powerful one as well. Uh, if we are able to set this on an object and we try to log in with that object, they are prompted for a password change. And it doesn't ask you about the old password. You just need to input the new password. So essentially, you, you get full control over the, over the, the account or, or object. Self is also pretty cool. We could, for example, add ourselves to a group, right? So there are many, many, many more object permissions than this, but I just wanted to point out some of the interesting ones for a pen tester. And we're going to focus on the generic all one, right? So let's close Notepad and go back to our PowerView script. And now I need to do some copy and paste because those commands are a little bit long. We're going to run something called get object ACL. There is a simpler way of doing it, uh, which you will probably realize eventually if you take the course, but we are going to do this super manually for now. So we're running get object ACL. The identity is going to be management department because this is the department we, we want to see right now. Uh, and we want to see the active directory rights that equal to generic all on the management department, right? So anyone that has generic all on the management department is going to show up when we run this command. So let's try this. And again, as usual, we get a bunch of data, right? It seems like we have like, yeah, five or six objects or something here. What I'm marking here now is one object that has generic all permissions on the management department, right? So we should probably parse the data a little bit and try to make sense of this. The object DN here, we are not really interested in because we already know that we are enumerating the management department, right? Object SID might be interesting, but we can see that the object SID is the same throughout our output here. So I would take an educated guess here and say that this is the SID for the management department, and we don't necessarily care about that one either. What we actually care about here is the Active Directory right, and this SID in the security identifier. The security identifier here is the SID for the object that has generic all permissions on the management department, right? So let's try to make a little bit more sense of this. I'm going to copy and paste again. We're going to run the same. Well, actually, let me... I need to learn how to, to actually use the keyboard here, like there. So we're running the same command all the way up here. This is the same command that we just run, but we are piping it into select and we want to see security identifier and the active directory rights and those only, right? Let's do this. And now we have a little bit more manageable output. We have the SID for whoever has generic all permissions on the management department, right? Now you can also run a command called find, I think it's called find interesting ACL with Power Review and it's gonna do, that's a hint if you, if you wanna go through the labs or the, or, or the course where it's gonna be a little bit easier because now we have to translate those SIDs and everything. The find the interesting ACL, I think it's translating the SIDs into friendly name uh, directly. So we need to translate those numbers we see here somehow. We can do that with Power Review as well. Yeah, and as uh, being mentioned in a, in a chat there, every single object in AD has a SID, right? So let's try to convert those into a name. And I'm going to comma separate them like this. Uh, this is an awful lot of manual work on a Friday. I, I kind of regret doing this on a Friday. Uh, note for you, Jeremy, uh, later, right? Uh, but we comma separate them. And we piped this into convert SID to name, right? So now we are translating the SIDs into actual names. So we see here domain admins, not really a big surprise because they do have full access to pretty much everything. But do you guys see anything of interest in the output here? I really, really hope you do, right? 
let's do some awkward silence until I you know, until I see some uh, yeah boom uh, shank or something here Stephanie marker pen nice Steph yes this is not something you would normally see in a domain right I would say unless it's a misconfiguration or maybe it's by attention I mean who knows but Stephanie in fact has generic all permissions on the management department so what can we do with the management department? Any suggestions on, on what we can do here now, since we have full access to it? We could do pretty much anything, but I, I wanna see some, some uh, we could even more. I mean, yeah, we, we, we could start Mimikatz at this point, but we, we wouldn't really be able to get much, right? Since we, we, we don't have any other, I mean, if Jeff Admin was logged into Client 75, even at this point, we wouldn't be able to do Mimikatz because we are not domain or local admin. You will, have, you will need to have uh, admin rights to, to use Mimikatz. But keep in mind, we are in full control over the group, right? We can't really impersonate any tokens here because we, we don't have any tokens to impersonate. Add Stephanie to admin. I'm going to go ahead and say that Alice is on the right path there. I think what you mean is we could add Stephanie to management department, right? Since we have full access to the group, we could go ahead and do that. Before doing it, let's do a get net group and choose uh, management department department uh, and select member we only have gen there right if i do net user uh let's see net user stephanie no we need to do net group management department and we can point to stephanie add we need to remember our slash domain otherwise this is going to be running on our client which it won't work we can see that the command succeeded. Let's do a GetNet group on the management department again. And we can see instead of just having Jen there now, we have both Jen and Stephanie due to the generic all privilege on the group, right? So we have full access on the, on the management department. And if we recall back now, Jen was a member of the management department, which again was a member of the development department, which again was a member of the sales department. We now have the same permissions with Stephanie. So at this point, I would say it would be a really good idea to repeat parts of the enumeration we have done. And this kind of goes back to what Amy showed with the, with the methodology earlier, right? The, the cycle kind of repeats itself because we don't really know yet, but we may have just escalated our privileges within the domain due to the group membership, right? But I want to show you another cool thing instead. So let's go ahead and remove Stephanie from the management department group and verify that we did clean up after ourselves. Now only Jen is there. Given the name of the management department group, I think Jen might be an interesting account to look closer at, right? So let's enumerate the object permissions on the user Jen as well. Exactly the same command as before. We just replaced management department with Jen. We are looking for generic all permissions and we are interested in seeing the security identifier and the active directory rights. Boom. Let's see what happens. So again, we have five things here. We remember earlier that the 502, uh, 512 here, Sid, belong to domain admins. Let's just be a little bit more on point here. I'm going to I'm going to try and convert this SID into a friendly name. <clears throat> What's his current use right now? Okay, so we are still, before I translate this, I just want to show we are still connected as Stephanie, right? But with, with the permissions, by adding ourselves to different groups, we may have more permissions in the domain. But we have removed ourselves from the, from the domain groups, right, to do some new enumeration. So we are still operating under Stephanie here. Let me redo the, the commander, get the ACL, and I'm gonna copy this and convert SID to name. What does this tell us? Oh, 
about Stephanie and the relationship here with the gen object. It's essentially the same as before. We had management department, we could add ourselves to the group, but what can we potentially do with a user if we have full access to it? We're gonna do some awkward silence again until, <clears throat> until I get some, some, uh, some recommendations on what to do here. I'm stuck in my pen test. I'm totally stuck. Yes, we could potentially impersonate, but how? It's not like we have a, a NTLM hash or anything, right? Enum domain more, yes. We could do that as well. We could continue do, uh, domain enumeration with Stephanie now, but we, we could potentially do something else. The SID is just another way of saying the username, essentially. Every object has, has some SID, uh, and we just converted it to Stephanie. So the SID won't really help us here. But we have full access to gen. What can we do to the gen user object to gain access to the gen user? Change permissions. Yes, we could do that, but why? We, we already have full permissions. Yes, we could change the password, right? I like it. We can change the password. We should be able to do that using net.exe, right? Let's try. Net user, gen. Let's do a very strong password. Password with our capital P, one, two, three. This is my favorite password. I also know that Amy uses it on, on pretty much everything. So I didn't say that, but yeah. Net yep, user gen. Free account. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Password one to three slash domain. We need to run this via the domain controller, right? Because Gen doesn't have a user on the client 75. Let's do this. And we can see that the command completed successfully, which is pretty cool, right? Due to the generic call, we have now changed Gen's password. And now we kind of get into the impersonate kind of stuff. We're gonna move now from Stephanie to Gen in the domain, right? To do that, we could log out and log in again, but I'm a little bit lazy. It's Friday after all. We're gonna do our run as. Let's do slash user, specify the domain, gen, and let's start powershell.exe, right? This is now still gonna launch on client 75, but let's try this. Password one, two, three. Ooh, we have a PowerShell prompt here, a new one. Let me just do PowerShell. EP bypass and then increase the font. Otherwise it's gonna get a little bit messy here. Let's see, 28. I think that was what we had earlier, right? Yeah. So let's clear screen. Who am I? We are now logged in as corp gen, right? So we have a new user. And again, this goes back to what Amy said earlier about repeating the enumeration. And this is, this is gonna, gonna work as kind of an eye opener when it comes to that kind of stuff. With our new user gen, let's go ahead and load PowerShell. I mean, PowerView, we go into the tools folder, import module, PowerView, right? Good old lateral movement, yes, that's true, Wally. So just to show here, who am I? We are now corp gen, right? Let's run find local admin access. We didn't get any output from this on Stephanie earlier. So let's see if we're in, uh, we are in luck with, with a gen here. And all of a sudden we start seeing some, some nasty stuff uh, coming up here, right? We have local admin access on the web of four, files of four, client 74 and client 76. So does anyone from the chat recognize some potential attack vectors we could do here to compromise the entire thing and become domain admin. Gen is not a domain admin, no. The only domain admins are Jeff admin and uh, administrator. Yeah, so uh, Cypher here, Cypherbytes, client 74, that's, that's interesting, right? Why is the client 74 interesting? I'll show you just to, you know, combine all of this together. Let's start PS logged on again and point to files, no, client 74, client 74. I have to agree on the license here. 
we have with gen right we are logged in as gen here we have local admin access to four boxes including client 74 where jeff admin is logged in and yes cypherbytes now we can get well hopefully right we can potentially get jeff admin's token we could log in to client 74 and possibly hijack into one of the processes jeff admin is running as well and just impersonate him that way uh, that's for a different AD module though. Now we are dealing with enumeration, although I'm going to have to admit that we did some attacks here as well. Um, resetting the, the gen password and logging in as gen is considered an, an attack, right? But this just proves that you, you will have to layer out your enumeration a little bit. You need to start somewhere. And once you get a new foothold, you have to re repeat the process. It's kind of a rinse and repeat, right? which goes back to the to the chart that Amy showed earlier. There, there's a little small chance that you might just get domain admin in your first lateral movement, but often you will have to chain different attacks together. And we can see how much we were able to, to get there by just moving to gen and getting local admin on a bunch of boxes. I mean, this even if Jeff admin wasn't logged in on client 74, I would consider this a great win because you can now log into those boxes and get a whole lot of information from them as well, right? So in a normal pen test, you would probably do that and gather as much information as possible. Does it make sense what we have done so far? If it doesn't, feel free to reach out on Discord as well after uh, the call. Uh, we'll we'll probably be there and and help out if if needed. I'm glad it makes sense. So the downside to what we have done now is that it's a lot of text, right? Even for just this very tiny environment we are working in here, this has been a lot of tests. Uh, Mooncake, I'm not sure if this is actually being recorded. Uh, I will have to check, but yeah, well, I, I will have to check that. You, you can reach out to me on Discord uh, after the call. Uh, my hand there is mighty, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll get that checked out. And yeah, the the uh, marker pen, the the I don't think PS logged on is covered in pen two hundred twenty twenty two uh, or object permissions. So this is a part of the new course, the pen two hundred twenty twenty three. There's a lot of differences be between the courses. Okay, so so Wally, uh, let, let me just read your question. I may have missed some stuff. So Stephanie had generic all permissions for the management department group, which Jen was a part of. And because of that, we had generic all access to Jen. No, so those are actually two different, those are actually two different accesses. Maybe I should have made that a little bit more clear, but we had generic all on the management department. And we added ourselves to the group and we moved ourselves just to kind of show it, right? The gen generical was a different one. So two different ones. The, the management department didn't have anything to do with, with the attack we just did on gen here. I hope that makes sense. If not, we, we, can, we can talk more about it later. I have more to show, right? What I wanted to say is that this is a lot of text. And I can understand that this might be a little bit scary to get into the Active Directory. I really hope that we are explaining things in a way in the course that this just, you know, it's going to be your second nature. Uh, I think so. I've seen students and also, you know, people uh, I've worked with earlier being a, kind of afraid of Active Directory. I don't really get why, but but I think it's just the fact that it's so complex and, and a huge, like a huge thing, right? But I would pick AD any day in a pen test over doing something else. I would 100% focus on AD because you, you have so much stuff there and uh, the chances for success are really high, right? So with that said, let me clear my screen and go back to our folder, the tools folder. We're gonna have a look at Bloodhound since I, sh uh, I promised that. Now, in order to use Bloodhound, Bloodhound is actually the, the tool you use to analyze data. In order to collect data, you're using something called Sharpound, which is also installed by default uh, on the Windows 11 client 75 box. So Sharpound is the collector. This is important to remember. Sharpound, Sharpound is the collector. Blowdown is what you use to analyze, right? So 
we're going to run Sharpound in the domain first, and then we're going to transfer the data over to Kali where we will use Bloodhound. So we're going to run this under Gen, right? Let's do a Who Am I? We are still logged in as Gen. We could do it from Stephanie as well. Uh, it won't really matter because Bloodhound is going to see it regardless. Let's do an import module Sharpound, right? Uh, that was PowerView. I'm sorry. Uh, it's getting late. We're going to import Sharpound. Now Sharpound is in memory. And to see the help, the command, they, this is actually a little bit weird. I, I don't understand why they did this. But in order to start Sharpound, you actually need to run the command invoke Bloodhound. I, I really don't know why it's like that. Uh, I think it might just have been a mistake or something from, from early days, and it just stayed like that. So I understand this is a little bit confusing. But let's have a look at the invoke Bloodhound command, right? The syntax is here. We need to run invoke blowdown. We need to choose a collection method, and we can choose whatever we want here. Uh, we can do search forest, stealth, LDAP filter, distinguish name, computer file. There are so many things we can do. Uh, for now, we're going to do it pretty simple. I'm going to copy and paste the command here. We're going to start invoke blowdown, use collection method all. This is pretty nasty. It's going to be a lot of noise in this network, right? you need to think a little bit about whether you should run this on a pen test or not, but in PWK, just go ahead, right? Uh, the output directory is going to be C colon tools and the output free prefix, we want the file to start with corp audit, right? So let's run this. And in a bigger production environment, this might take hours, right? Uh, but in our case, it's probably not going to take as long. Uh, in the output here, we can see what we are enumerating, group, local admin, GPO local group, sessions, logged on, trusts, etc., cetera, DCOM, SPM targets, many, many, many different things we are enumerating here. Um, Bloodhound also supports something called looping so that you can tell Bloodhound to loop for X amount of hours because right now we are essentially taking a snapshot of the domain, how it looks like now, right? So if someone logs in in, let's say, two hours, we won't be able to see that. But you may have log on or blow down or sharp on just running for a longer amount of time to be able to gather more information. But in this case, and in pen 200, <clears throat> you don't need to worry about looping. Everything is there already, right? So we can see that it completed. Let's have a look in our tools folder and see if uh, we have some uh, files there. We have a corp audit. I know this is a little bit small, but we have the file here. It's a zip file, which now contains a bunch of JSON files, which is used for the graphing, right? We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Now, we could install Bloodhound on Windows, but I'm rather just going to use the one I have in Kali. And I'm going to start some file transfers here. Um, earlier today, when I discussed this, uh, this um, presentation with a colleague, I was using FTP. And he was like, who use FTP in 2023, right? Uh, but I've been using FTP now for like, I don't know, 30 years or something, and it just works. But I decided, okay, maybe I should try to be one of the cool guys as well. So I'm just going to set up a share on my Calibox using a packet SMB server uh, called share. Uh, we're going to put this file into my desktop we're going to enable SMB2 support, right? So the share should be running now. Let me go grab my IP address because I never remember that. We are connected to the VPN. So it's this one. Let's just exit. With the share running, we can now go ahead and do backslash backslash on the IP address. We can see the share folder. And let's go ahead and open a new file explorer here and just... Uh, uh, yes, Bloodhound is allowed on the exam. Uh, X Sentinel something. I, I don't know how to 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 state your name, but yeah, you you can use Bloodhound in the exam. So let's go ahead and copy the zip file into our nice share. There you go. Now I'm just gonna minimize Windows. We are done with Windows. Finally, back to good old Kali, right? Let's go to the desktop. We have a corp audit file here. In order for Bloodhound to work, we need a service running called Neo4j, which is a NoSQL database. 
And instead of having rows and columns, it supports graphs, right? And we will see why in a, in a couple of minutes here, or seconds rather. Let me start Neo4j. Okay, it was already running. So let's start Bloodhound, right? We go through detail how to start and you know configure Bloodhound in the course. So I'm not gonna go through that right here, but I'm gonna log into the database, the Neo4j database. And let's see, we probably get, yeah, we get no data returned from query here, which makes sense because we don't have any data. We need to upload the zip file. We could do that either by dragging it into the window or we could go to the upload data on the right side here. I know this is a little bit small, but I'm explaining everything I'm doing and I, I won't be able to make this bigger. I'm sorry. Let's go to desktop and choose the bloodhound.zip file that we just generated on the Windows machine using Sharpound. We hit open. And we can see that he's now currently unzipping a bunch of JSON files, right? So there is one JSON file for computers, for example. This file contains all the information about the computers in the domain. Easy as that. Right. We could also tell Bloodhound not to do zip file and just drag and drop JSON files in here. But we can see that the process is complete. Let's clear and close this window. On the top left, we click and we can see the database info here. We can see, for example, on prem object user zero. This I know this is wrong, right? What you sometimes have to do when you are in Bloodhound is to refresh the database stats. Click down here. And if you go up again, we can see that it updated, right? Now we can see 10 users, 57 groups, six computers, etc. We also appear to have seven sessions, 710 ACLs. We enumerated two of them earlier and we got all that output. Imagine how difficult this would be to enumerate 710. And we only have a small domain, right? Node info is not populated right now. We actually need to choose or or click on some nodes in order to get info here. I know I'm going a little bit fast, but we are running out of time. So I want to show this. If you go to analysis tab, there is a bunch of pre-built queries already built into Bloodhound. We can run our own queries as well. We are touching base on that in a course, but for now let's click the find all domain admins query, right? We click it, we get some nodes here and we can arrange those the way we want drag them a little bit closer together, maybe like this, and then we can zoom in. The text is really getting bigger, but this is Jeff admin. And the line you see in between here is known as an edge. So Jeff admin here is a node, the line here is an edge. I like to just call them lines to be honest, even though that's kind of not the technical term for them. But we can see here a very small text that Jeff admin is a member of the domain admins. And we can see the administrator also is a member of the domain admins, right? So instead of going through a bunch of texts in PowerView or NetEXE, we just see this in graphs, which is pretty cool, right? Now, let's go a little bit further down. I want to show two more queries for the call. We have something called find shortest path uh, to domain admins, right? Let's click it and choose the domain admins group. And we're going to have a lot more nodes here. Now, this may not always show you an attack path in the Active Directory. I actually like to run this in penetration tests and have a look at the shortest path because it's so easy to see what servers and users are kind of a central component in the network, right? This is a small network, um, but we can still see some centralized things here. For example, Client74, we can easily see that this is an important thing because so many nodes have edges towards it, right? And we also see the has session from Jeff Admin here, right? So if you look a little bit closer, starting on the left, Stephanie, for example, if we hover over Stephanie here, we can see a red line directly into the main admins. And this states that if you have access to Stephanie, you should be able to get the main admin as well somehow, right? You just need to follow the lines and figure out exactly what's going on here. I'm going to try to make this a little bit uh, more clear, the attack path we found earlier, uh, because there is another query that is that you, you, you will be able to, to add users or objects you have owned, right? So in this case, I'm going to click on Stephanie and see that node info is being populated. We can see the same 
uh, or some of the same um, uh, attributes we saw earlier when we did manual enumeration. So node info is also a great one. But if we right click Stephanie here and we click mark user as owned, it's going to get a skull icon next to it. I, I can zoom in maybe a little bit more. I don't know if you guys can see this, but we have now marked Stephanie as owned, right? Let's do the same with client 75. Let's forget all the enumeration we did earlier, right? Let's just say we know that we have control over Stephanie. We have control over client 75 because that was our starting point, right? Even though owning client 75 might be a little bit of a lie here because we haven't escalated our privileges, right? But at least we have partial control over it. Now we can go back to analysis. And there is another query called shortest paths to domain admin from own principle, right? This is a really cool one because this is now going to show the shortest path from Stephanie or client 75. So let's click it, choose the domain admins group, and let's just get rid of this. And let's also just rearrange, uh, rearrange this a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see so we can, we can zoom in a little bit. Sorry if you're hearing a dog barking, by the way, uh, in the background here. I have a very angry neighbor dog right now. He, he sounds a little bit pissed. Maybe it's his AD we're, we're uh, enumerating. I mean, who knows? Okay, no barking, good. That means my micro microphone is working, right? So we owned Client 75 and we own Stephanie. And we can, I mean, this is pretty easy to see what we can do here, right? The edge between Stephanie and Jen here says we have generic wall permission on Jen. So we can, well, actually we did already. We reset her password, right? So we can take over or impersonate Jen. We can see between Jen and client 74, it says execute DCOM here. We know that Jen has local admin on client 74, which I would say is probably a little bit more powerful. But if we right click the edge and click help, and click abuse info, we actually get some commands we can run from client 75 as gen as well to get a shell on client 74. We are going over execute decom in the lateral movement module for AD. So you will get to know this stuff pretty well. Um, we can also go to OPSEC considerations, right? Uh, we get a lot of information about how decom is built up and what to kind of look out for from a SOC, well, if, if you need to fly under the radar, right? This is kind of a nice place to, to, to go if you want to see what you need to consider during the attack. But we know that we can just log into Client 75 and, and you know, be admin there. Jeff Admin, he has a session, so we can right click the edge here as well and click help. Uh, and if we click abuse here, we can see some uh, references to Mimikatz, for example. I saw that Mimikatz was mentioned in a chat earlier. We can use that for password theft or, or uh, you know, getting NTLM hashes, right? We can also do token impersonation, uh, which is also something we are talking about in the course itself. So that's for another call, right? We are dealing with the enumeration here, but I would say we're doing a pretty good job on it because we, we have a pretty straightforward attack path right here. And then obviously in the end, Jeff Admin is a member of the domain admins. So if we're able to impersonate Jeff Admin, we have full control over the domain, right? And that's it. Amy, it's your turn to talk a little bit. I've been talking too much now, I think. <laughs> Any questions to, to anything uh, on what we have gone through? We only have three minutes left, so we, we kind of need to end the stream soon. Uh, there is an office hour coming up in, in three minutes. So I don't see any questions in the chat that you haven't already answered, Remy. Um, no, I wasn't sure on the recording, Amy. Uh, I don't know, is, maybe you. Yes, uh, I did get confirmation. It is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube. Um, I see someone was asking about the resolution. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the resolution will be. Um, I know that it's not been very easy to see um, the output of uh, Bloodhound, but at least Remy has explained yeah. every single step of the way. Um, we can show, we do have a copy, uh, a screenshot of this. It might be a little bit clearer in the presentation. Um, 
while you do Thank that, you, uh, actually, let, let me just, uh, we have some questions about, uh, that there is some confusions about Jen here. Um, let me, if we have the time for it, I'm going to log into the uh, domain controller again. Let's say we just compromise the whole thing, right? Uh, we can imagine that we, 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 are, we are just in total control and we're going to go into the domain controller and check what exactly happened with Jen, right? If we start Active Directory here as domain admin again, and we search for the user Jen, and we go into the security tab, we see Stephanie here. If we go to advanced, uh, let's see, Stephanie, where are you? There you are. She has full control, right? If we double click this, those are actually the ACEs, or this is the ACL that I was talking about earlier, access control list. So this is being verified. Okay, is Stephanie really allowed to change Jen's password? Yes, she is, because she has full control over the account, right? I hope that clears it up. If not, hit me up on Discord and I'll, I'll gladly go through this once again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Amy, uh, you, you're off. No, no problem. <laughs> I was about to hijack your screen, so I'm glad that I waited a second. Uh, so obviously this is our time for Q&A. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, you're sharing your screen, by the way. Uh, uh, oops, <laughs> wrong screen. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's my motto. That's my motto for getting things done. In nice, case nice, anyone nice was, was wondering. I need, I need that background as well. There we go. <laughs> uh, I, I was certain I did share the right screen, but you know how uh, computers don't want to comply when they need to. Um, uh, I was talking about our screenshot, and this is it uh, for anyone who would like to see it maybe a little bit clearer than it was um, directly from Bloodhound. I'm just typing a little bit in, in the chat here, sorry. No problem. All right. No, yeah, I, I think, I mean, anyone, we anyone are- who's asking about those dates, sorry, Remy, there, someone has just posted in the, in the chat all the dates of the Offsec Labs. Uh, for anyone that was asking. All right, there is, oh, we even have a thank you slide. That's awesome. That's cool. No problem, uh, Wig7. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a fun time. Hopefully we can do it again at some point as well. Uh, I'm happy that, that many of you guys liked it. So, so that's cool. I think it's time to end the stream then, Amy. Um, yep. And uh, it I is. Wish... You both, you both did awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I forgot that you were here even. So <laughs> I'm sorry for. I'm sorry. I was just a, a little fly on the wall. Yeah, I'm sorry for going one minute over. That was not all my good, intention. All good. All good. Right. Uh, thank you guys. To do offsite live oh. right now. Not offsite live. Discord. Office hours. We need yes. to end the stream right for that or. How, yeah, we're going to end the stream and then stay around. We'll be back in just a moment. Yeah. Hang around, guys. I wish you all a nice Friday. Enjoy your time and happy pen testing AD. It's, yes. I promise you it's going to be fun. So thank Same you. Same for me. Have a good yep, one. Yep. Cheers, Have everyone. Good one. Bye. Bye-bye.